parent and I have I have a first grader um, at Mary Lynn, and so we are going to be impacted um, should the cluster rezone. Um, and I guess I am in support of um, keeping Mary Lynn at, uh, keeping Inman Park students at Mary Lynn. And um, I would just like to voice my concerns that um, I think that the, my biggest concern is that Mary Lynn's capacity will be reduced drastically. And I don't see um, a way to infill that community. Um, and I haven't seen any other forward thinking directions in why this would be the best solution for our community. I've been engaged in this process for two to three years now. So um, I, I'm really aware of a lot of things, but I guess my biggest concern really is the biggest elephant in the room is there is no way that this plan or policy is going to be um, helping with the midtown um, overcrowding issue. So I'm wondering what is your stance on this and how can you support um, those of us who feel the same way that I do? No, thank you for sharing. Um, obviously I'm paying close attention to everything. And as you know, you know, there've been scenarios that have been put forth and there've been feedback sessions. So thank you for your engagement and participation at the, those levels. Um, so at this point, you know, we have a recommendation from the superintendent and the lines were adjusted, which Mary Lynn, that wasn't a line that was adjusted. That was part of the scenarios going in. There's been a line that's been adjusted since the feedback from the scenarios, which obviously affects Morningside and some, you know, families um, that feed into Spark. So clearly there was a lot of conversation around that on Monday, people only having about a week to kind of digest that in advance of the first read on Monday. What I'm telling people at this point is to continue to fight, provide feedback directly to the superintendent, to the district, you know, putting it in let's talk is extremely helpful. As you saw, there was information on that during the presentation Monday. By the way, does everybody have the most recent presentation from Monday? Okay. No, I will send that out. You could link it. That'd be great. Cause I, I did some digging. I couldn't find it online. Yeah, I will. It, it's Watched under, it. it's, I know we, we need to do, I think more work on our website and accessibility for some things, um, but it is in Simply, which is a really useful tool, which is how we access our documents too, but it's underneath the board of educations page. It's like not on the main page, but if you go to the main page and put in um, K-5 recommendation, I mean, it should come up, but I will send it out. Um, and along those lines- Simbly, S-I-M-B-L-Y. S-I-M-B-L-I. Okay. But it is, I'll send it out to you all too. And I'll actually put some instructions in there about how to access Simbly. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but just, to, just from an educational perspective, did, did Simbly replace like the board docs tool that was used in the past? It's, it should be the same one. Okay. It is the board docs tool. Um, which I actually find very user friendly. Like I just went and pulled up the document that I'm going to send to someone right now, but I'll send it to all of you. And along those lines, please, everybody put your email um, in the chat. I want to make sure I have your contact information. Keith, can you help me with that? Maybe there's no chat function on this call. Really? Okay. You're right. There is not. <laughs> okay. Well, let me see if um, I can correct it. Yeah, if you could, because what I'll do that might be easier is put in my email and you all email me. I just want to make sure I have everyone's email address from this call because I usually have a sign in sheet. So anyway, I'll send you that for Monday. But back to your question, Mary, um, about fe providing feedback to the district. Um, this is my first time with a process such as this. Clearly, this is, again, within the superintendent's purview. You know, I don't know if particular tweaks will be made to this recommendation, how that will potentially, you know, be altered or not. Um, we have at least a month, if not more, um, for discussion with the community still and presentation about, you know, who all will be impacted, plans for transition and support from the district. Um, and then, of course, this would not go into effect until the 2023-2024 school year. Still, having said all that, providing feedback is important. So continue to do that. 
Um, I, you know, I, I hear you on the change for Inman Park to Spark from Mary Lynn and looking at Mary Lynn's numbers. And I think if I were you, I'd, Mary, I'd also ask for more clarity from the district about why they feel that's the best decision long-term for Mary Lynn. I think having more information about that and that's something I will dig into as well with you. Um, Cause I, you know, that that's what's gotta be provided regarding all of this, like how this best serves students. I, just for clarity, I emailed um, again today and these have been my um, concerns all the way around. Um, if we have um, capacity for it, will there be an improved pre-K um, availability program? I, I am in favor of that. I don't think that it's well accessed through APS in our cluster. And I think that that's a frustration. Secondly, transportation has been, I have no other way to describe it other than a hot mess, um, even through Mary Lynn this year. And so I'm very concerned that um, our bus situation is going to be really a desperate situation going to um, Springville Park. Um, and I just, I don't have a lot of faith that um, the communication has been very consistent through the district to other neighborhoods. And so I have asked all of those questions in the let's talk and I usually get back um, a kind response, but I don't feel that any of the responses have actually been in line with the entire process of what's been happening. There has been one answer that sort of supports maybe the, the four or five academy. And then there was another answer that supported something else. And then there was another shift that said, okay, well, maybe we'll be going the morning side route. And then I had another shift where, okay, maybe we'll be doing a dual campus route. And then it just, I, I just feel so frustrated. I've been participating the way that I've, um, you know, been told through the let's chat function. And I just feel like, my, um, I, I'm doing my civic duty to make sure that I'm advocating for my kids and for my community. And I just feel like APS keeps like kind of pulling the rug out from under us. So, you know, I really respect your position here, but I really want to make sure that you're also advocating for our needs. So um, thank you for your time and your support and for answering these questions, but I really hope we can get some answers. I hear you. No, you definitely deserve answers 100%. Um, I love that you brought up pre-K. That's something I brought up on Monday that I'm looking forward to the opportunities around that because as you all well know, the only school that has pre-K in the entire Midtown cluster or room for it is Hope Hill, which they're going to run out of room too. And I'm looking forward to the future of Hope Hill. Um, we need a whole new building there and we're going to get that whole property from the city. I feel confident. Um, but yeah, I mean, y'all know some of you from, well, it's been a minute now, but Mary Lynn did have pre-K. Um, so I, I think that would be an awesome opportunity in creating more room at our elementaries in Midtown. But I hear you on transportation. Um, it's been a struggle and we all know COVID impacted that additionally, but considering traffic and everything else in our city, we have to be very real about that. So I appreciate you lifting all of that up. I will follow up with the team as well on those issues. So, um, and then, you know, certainly as we wrap up this meeting, not now, but at the end, I want to emphasize and make sure I follow up with you all on the date for the next engagement meeting around this. Because being there in person or virtually and sending this information and having it addressed there, I think it's extremely important. So I'm not gonna forget to mention that. So thank you, Mary. And next, Keith, are you keeping um, tabs on who's next? Is it Melissa? I. Melissa, I'm gonna. Hey there, how's it going? Next. <laughs> um, I'm Mary Lynn Parent, and um, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, <clears throat> I, a few things I wanted to bring up is <clears throat> there was a survey that was spread um, throughout the Mary Lynn community. Seventy-eight percent of the parents are in favor of keeping Mary Lynn intact. We had over three hundred responses. Um, there's, you know, we just feel like that <clears throat> that sentiment hasn't been shared, especially hearing that you were in favor of rezoning. That was really tough to hear, knowing that this has been spread community-wide. We are in favor of Spark Dual Campus for so many reasons, but the largest is it's best for the whole Midtown cluster, especially thinking about it's not really addressing the high school capacity issues that we're experiencing. Um, we are incredibly 
um, you know, I think we just need to create a real long-term plan for mm -hmm. our cluster. Mm -hmm. And the Spark Dual Campus option will disrupt the least amount of students and teachers and prevent the creation of three new elementary schools, which will all be shells of schools that we're gonna be you know, creating as parents for the next three to five years. So we strongly believe that we need a cluster-wide solution that prioritizes Midtown High School's capacity. Um, and honestly, like I would love your feedback, why our feedback wasn't taken into consideration when you voted for rezoning. Well, a lot of things impact there. Um, First and foremost, I agree 100%. We need a better process in terms of planning. Um, this has been the case too often for APS. We are pushed up against a wall on this one. Um, with Morningside not even be able to come back into their building post renovation because they're so over capacity. So there's clearly been a lot of conversation about the elementary for a while and, and men. And of course, you all know uh, four or five was put out before. Um, and that did not happen. So here we are at this point, and I'm glad we're going through the facilities master planning process because we have to have a five and a 10 year plan and absolutely have to look at the capacity issues around that for Midtown um, and not take off just little pieces. We need to look long range and same for, in my community, Jackson High School, which is over capacity already now. And that was even faster than it happened for y'all. Um, in terms of the feedback on Mary Lynn, I have been listening very, very closely. And I'm not saying you all have not been speaking up. I have gone to all the meetings. Um, and I've seen, you know, obviously the different scenarios with people being shifted. Um, I have not heard as much about, you know, and I know Inman Park has been very neutral on it. And I think it's very important to hear directly from families and not just neighborhood associations. Not that I don't appreciate their perspective as well. Um, but I think it's great that you're lifting this up underneath in regards to the K-5. I would also put out, you know, I, with the split campus, I look at it split campus and K-5 and the K-5 recommendation coming from the superintendent talking about all the supports that can be brought in for the K-5. And it's a model that's been obviously used throughout the Midtown cluster and you have the space to do it, where a lot of our split campuses throughout the district have been solely we have a capacity issue and we're just shifting this group of kids out. Um, I, I will lean on the district on this one to explain you know, why exactly. Again, Inman Park has to come out of Mary Lynn. I think you know, we need to lift up that issue separately. Um, because when I'm looking at a recommendation, I'm looking at, can students be well served? Like we're looking at student outcomes and can the district support it at that level? And based on everything I saw and was there stakeholder engagement? Yes. Was there as much information going out a week before the first read after the lines have been adjusted? Maybe not. And that's why we have this time period. The entire board asks that we have more time to make sure we're reaching everyone impacted by this decision, getting that additional feedback and talking about, again, why the district thinks this is the best decision for student outcomes and how it's supported. So those questions have to be addressed 100%. But I encourage you all, and I will bring this back to you to just have a deeper dive into, again, Inman Park coming out of Maryland. But at this point, you know, I do feel that the K-5 will be the decision. I do. I think it's at this point, providing the feedback on any issues and concerns around that, that need, you know, to be addressed and further discussed and making sure everybody knows what's going on. Um, but again, I cannot agree with you more on having a better long-term process on this. this. This is not optimal for anyone. This is not how we should be planning. We should be checking in annually with everyone to say, here we are. Here's our capacity at our schools, and here's what could potentially shift because that does happen. Um, clearly, Spark came out of Morningside, and we have, and I do believe you will have more families coming to your schools, particularly looking at Midtown. Even though I know there are not as many maybe school aged children right now, there's a lot going on, and there'll be a lot more happening around Old Fourth Ward too. And I know I have a lot of questions, so I'll. I'll 
pause right there. But no, I, I will be asking for a deeper dive into the Mary Lynn situation in particular. Um, and we can always come back, Melissa, to you if you have additional questions. I'm gonna let's see, Aaron, I'm gonna go to you next. Hi. Um, Hi. First of all, I want to thank you for taking a minute or a minute uh, Zoom meeting to meet with us. Um, and thank you for the time you've put in on this. Um, so I've got, first, I want to echo what um, Mary and Melissa were talking about. I, I'm glad they brought up the points they did because they said it more eloquently than I could have. Um, so full disclosure, this might be a little bit of a jumble as I only have a first grader and last year was all virtual. So a lot of this is new to me. Um, I guess one of the things I'd like to know about is um, if there have been um, academic studies on the impact of a dual campus and um, sort of how the new map would work. Um, I'd also like to know, um, so you voted in favor of the switch and um, I know that the families I've spoken with feel very unrepresented in this. Uh, and I, I guess I would like to know if, if it's the kindest way to say this. Um, I just would like to know if you feel like you're in a place where your mind can still be changed or are we sort of just talking to ourselves in an echo chamber, if that makes sense. Um, because it, it feels like there's sort of been a lot of decisions made that have been coming down the line. I mean, sort of like the Hope Hill direction. And then it sort of feels like that was some sort of strange scare tactic to then when this newest proposal was put forth that like, oh, you'll be grateful. You're actually gonna go to these schools that you know better that are already part of things. And um, I think it's just frustrating to feel like we are putting forth the effort and trying to talk to the right people and um, sort of just to feel like it's not being heard. And I know that it's hard to it's hard to think about with all of the upset that our kids have been through and our families have been through with COVID and how disconnected we felt and um, our personal families it's sort of different thing as we moved here in August of 2020 and so the connections we've made are really dear to us and the idea of you know being cut off from our in park families feels like having a limb cut off and I know that sounds dramatic but when you've moved across the country. Uh, keeping those connections it, it, it's incredibly dear. And so um, the idea of just the practical upsets of my daughter's you know good friends, I, all of a sudden I have to tell her they're gone. And I, I mean, I know this is a very micro issue, but um, th this couldn't be nearer or dearer to our hearts. And so feeling heard, it, it's just such a big deal. So I guess I sort of just rambled on, but I, I hope you get the spirit of, of what I'm asking. No, and I appreciate everything you lifted up 100%. And just so I have clarity, are you, you're not in Inman Park, but you're Mary Lynn, correct? Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, okay. I'm in, um, yep. I'm in Candler Park, um, okay. Lake Lake area. And um, so, I mean, this is, our kids would stay in the same place, um, but, you know, based on where our, our younger kids go to preschool and I mean, the Inman Park families are, are a huge piece of all of it. I mean, our, our daily life. I mean, the, there's not a day that goes by that I, I'm not touching base with so many families that this would really impact um, both from rezoning and the, their kids going elsewhere, but also the impact of those of us who would stay put. I mean, the, I mean, look at even like Inman Park Festival. This is a group of families that are so invested in their community, uh, both from just a, a social standpoint, but also the way that they give in time and money. I mean, it's just, there's no end to the value. I mean, in, in our class parents, for instance, so many classes have uh, families from both sides of Moreland. And that adds so much. I mean, the, the just the history of both sides and, and just the fun and the involvement and in things like Linapalooza. And I mean, honestly, I, I could make a list for three days about the ways that uh, those, the, the two sides of the, you know, Moreland, the way those all are, are intertwined. And it's, it's really heartbreaking to think of losing that on so many different levels. And I mean, wherever Inman Park ends up, that will be a great boon to that community, but it would be a huge loss to us and we would be left sort of a shell. And um, 
Yeah. I'm I, I, sorry. I'm starting to repeat myself. No, no, no. No, I appreciate all that. And yes, definitely. Emmon Park has a deep tie to Mary Lynn, no doubt. Um, yeah. I mean, none of this is, is easy. I, I completely understand that. And it is going to be happening over here in my community as well. Um, and different because we have much lower numbers in a lot of our schools than you all do. Um, and, and, and it's an adjustment. I do push back a little on the shell piece. I, I think you all have, you know, very committed, invested families who are, you know, well, your schools will continue to grow. Um, but again, I, I think we need a deeper dive into the move of Emmon Park to Maryland. I mean, out of Maryland, excuse me. Um, and more information from the district on that and looking at projections um, around your concerns about there not being as many families coming in. Um, and going back in time some, you know, Emmon Park, a lot of people speaking up strongly in the initial recommendation or scenario rather, it was not a recommendation, scenario around Emmon Park going to Hope Hill or the K-5. So there, there have been a lot of, you know, renditions put out, scenarios, a lot of feedback, a lot of pushback, um, and here we are today. And to be quite honest and real, I mean, there are going to be people upset about whatever we end up doing, no doubt. And I and I appreciate that. If you all weren't advocating as hard as you are for your schools, that would be a problem. <laughs> like I, that is it's a change, and that is extremely hard. What is ex critically important is that the district shows, going back to your question or whoever had that about academic. Um, data information around split campus, around K-5, you know, what are the benefits um, educationally for our children? How are we gonna have, you know, again, strong student outcomes and support from the district? That goes back to this transportation. And that was one thing, you know, I had some questions around for the K-5. I think there were so many benefits to a K-5 for sure, bringing the community together, the school communities together before Howard. I think that would have been great for a lot of kids, especially on equity, but I did have concerns about the transportation plan because that's a different model in the midst of a, a lot of moving around in that cluster. So that's how I'm, you know, raising these issues that need to be addressed so we know exactly what's going on. And I definitely want to hear more and more from, you know, Inman Park families, and I'll reach out after this call for sure to make sure, you know, I stay very connected to them as well. Um, so I want to make sure I'm hearing from, you know, everyone who wants to speak up on this is issue. So I appreciate you lifting up as a fellow Mary Lynn parent for sure. So I want you to know you are definitely heard um, taking in all this information and I encourage you all to stay involved in the process and we're going to make sure we get additional information around all your questions and concerns. And I think that needs to be voiced in a a community meeting and setting so other people hear it as well and it's recorded and shared so i and hear you so are you you are you feeling like you're open to to reconsidering your position on this or do you so feel again going back to the process on this this is a recommendation from the superintendent at this point this is where the board you know can ask questions about it but this board and i, I don't know if you listened on monday night Everyone was basically saying, we are good with the K-5. We have issues, some issues around the process and making sure everyone understood this most recent adjustment iteration. Um, this is not at the scenario point anymore. We had the scenarios, we had the feedback, and now we're at a point where a recommendation has been made by the superintendent. And at that point, you move forward on that recommendation. Like the split campus is not a formal option at this point. So at this point, again, the majority of the board definitely said they support the K-5. You know, when looking again at student outcomes, I don't see how this would not serve student well. Students well in a K-5, we've been doing that. Are there, you know, potential adjustments made the superintendent and team would make to address some issues and concerns that are coming up that need to be addressed? That, that might be the case. And that is within her purview and her team's purview. Our job as board members is to continue to push that information and feedback to them. And there'll be a series of meetings in May to meet with the community on it as well. 
Um, and I think the first one, Keith, I don't think you have that date yet, do we? Oh, no. no. Um, but we'll make sure everyone has that because that that's that's going to be critically important. But yeah, that's where we are in the, the process. This is a recommendation from the superintendent. We'll be acting on this actual recommendation. You know, it was set in June. That was a final vote, um, but it may be August. We may be pushing it back some for additional feedback. So sorry, just to clarify, because like I said, I'm new to this, so I'm not sure if I'm reading be between the lines correctly. Does that mean that everything's final? I mean, so I mean, we're making a, a final vote. vote. Like, there's only one recommendation put forth. We're only voting on one thing. There are not two options. There's one, which is the K five. Um, so that the recommendation from the superintendent, because you know. Our job as board members around policy and we do have to vote on rezonings, but this is one that's definitely under superintendent's purview to present what's best. Um, Cause you know, we're not this, I don't have educational expertise. Um, I represent the voices and bringing back feedback. And also we're a student outcomes focused governance board where we're looking at, you know what's best for students based on the data we're receiving and asking the questions of the superintendent to make sure you know she's being held accountable with her team to address things around making sure students are best served. So when you all bring things forward and you say, I don't think a child can get to school on time, or I see a huge gap in this K-5 model in terms of academics, that's something we need to continue to push in on if that's the case. But either way, I mean, you all can ask whatever question you want, and I will ask questions around data and support. And, you know, and of course, we don't have data from this particular model. But again, how we can bring in all the resources, principals, teachers, um, additional supports, making sure we can fund that and it's sustainable and it's strong. I mean, that's the stuff we're looking at for this model. Um, and long term, do we have room to grow? Because clearly that's been an issue within our elementaries, which is a great problem to have. But that's, so yeah, that's a long-winded explanation as to how we approach it as a board, but where we are, it's one recommendation. Any board member would tell you there is only one recommendation on the table right now, and it is the K-5. So that's where we are, and we'll take a final vote on that June or maybe August if it gets pushed back. Okay, well, I, I really hope you vote now. Thanks for your time. Sure, absolutely. And thank you for asking questions and please stay involved and continue to stay engaged. Oh, um, let's see. That that easy. <laughs> um, let's see. Kelly, have you? Hi there. Oh, I'm sorry. I know you spoke at the for a moment. Yes, I'm sorry. And um, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I am Kelly Kulikowski. I am a Maryland parent living in Inman Park. I also am. Um, now sit on the MM Park Education Committee, and I wanted to clarify um, some things around the MM Park position. And from my personal view, I think um, the Education Committee, first of all, is a representation of the neighborhood, but does not um, wholly represent all of the views of the neighborhoods. And I think when they form positions, they're very much, the, the committee is very much trying to take a position that will capture the most widely held views of the neighborhood. And I think, and again, there have been a lot of iterations to this process and um, Inman Park had a lot of table, like a lot of scenarios on the table initially that were um, dissatisfactory to many in the community. The number one being splitting our neighborhood down the middle. And I understand that's an issue for all communities in a rezoning conversation. We, however, are a small, the smallest community in the cluster, and we also are the only community that does not have a physical elementary school in our footprint. So again, so I think that the, the formation of the most recent Inman Park Education Committee um, position was based on feeling like we had two great schools that most people were comfortable sending their children to. Um, and again, also representing, I, I my personal view is, different than maybe the education committee's view, right? And so I'm trying to hedge that as I speak a little bit because I don't want to overset um, the committee's view or other neighbors' view. Um, so I just wanted to give a little background on why um, 
in the park took the neutral position. And I think um, one of the largest reasons supporting that was that very much feel like a decision needs to be made. Um, and uh, again, I'm speaking for the committee and that's probably unfair. Um, now I'm going to speak for myself only. Um, and I guess, and this probably echoes some of the viewpoints that have been raised so far, but I very much, you know, as a representative, as a board member, um, I have been, I have concerns again about the process as you all do. I, governance is very important to me and establishing process is very important to me and communication mm -hmm. as well. Um, I don't think that APS has done a great job of communicating the reasons that make a K through five um, a better recommendation than a dual campus. Um, and, and to echo the MM Park parents, I also have concerns about why Lynn should be polled. Um, but, but just from the two scenarios that were last on the table, I very much would like to have better data support for this decision-making process. And I asked the board to um, push the administration to communicate that to us as parents and shareholders. Um, and I, I, I honestly, it's, it's frustrating because we didn't get that with when the four or five was taken off the table. And I still have questions about that. I'm not trying to re, I, I know that's not on the table anymore, but I don't, I think we deserve a better explanation than when we received in that scenario. So I asked for that. Um, and again, to this is echoing other voices, but I'm concerned about the long-term strategic plan for the cluster, knowing that high school capacity is, you know, about to bust at the seams and um, also knowing that so far the district has said that there's not ability to make any physical modifications to the midtown building um i just again as a board member would ask for you to like have them consider thinking a little bit outside of the box on what some of the solutions would be um, again if the four if the k5 comes on the table then it seems like any novel grade configurations that might have solved that problem this would just kind of be a waste um, because we do have that large building central in the cluster at the MM building. Um, um, and again, I, I just think that we need a much better process when we are address, addressing the high school capacity issues down the road um, in terms of community engagement. I, I, I mean, I've sat on my first meeting on this subject pre COVID as a parent that did not yet have children in APS. Um, so I, I have been trying to stay engaged and involved and um, and I will continue to ask others in my community to do the same, but we really need like all hands on deck on this so that we don't get into this scenario where we've had, rec you know, this is, this is the second formal recommendation. And while APS has voiced that it wasn't based on parent feedback, I, again, it's, that seems somewhat unsubstantiated because we didn't get sound reasons why the four or five was taken off the table. Um, and I don't want to recreate this now because I think we are wasting time and resources on a subject that is less complicated than a lot of other issues in this district and in your, Katie, your you know footprint um, that you represent. So um, I asked for that. Um, and then a little bit more granularly, I, I have concerns about the K-5 and the utilization percentages of the um, K through fives that will be in the cluster. It seems like almost every building will have underutilized space. And I understand that growth is happening here, but growth is happening in a lot of other places to your point. I mean, Jackson is over capacity and like just, just physical boundaries and where the population is growing is is changing right like um so it does seem underutilized where where the dual campus could offer um other alternatives like a, a, a pre-k in the the spark building offering like other special services within mm -hmm. the, the spark or the the dual campus scenario um and and to that i i i'm also concerned and this Initially, um, when there was a recommendation, I think option one in the initial like four scenarios was for MM Park, one of the options was for MM Park to move to Hope Hill. And one of my concerns with that was that I think Hope Hill is currently at 82% capacity. Mm -hmm. We all know that that building is, is mm -hmm. so overdue for major, major changes. And it really made me happy to hear that you are 
strongly positioned to like take over the city's ownership of some of that property because that's problematic and it doesn't seem fair to me to, to, that like the the some of the underserved community within our cluster is having the least access to the best facilities um so I, I, that's promising but i also there's a lot of development going on in old fourth ward and new housing projects and that population is going to grow so this current proposal keeps does not offer any long-term solution for hope hill hope hill's at 82 percent the the i did pull up i did find the deck that you were referencing and and even in the scenarios of that and i understand that this is it, it, this has been a, something I've viewed from APS is that sometimes they'll like take little pieces out of the data presented and it's like, I want to see what the the 26 27 numbers are for Hope Hill and and like again these housing developments that are happening that are that it's there's there's different types of development, I know you know this happening in old fourth world there's low income housing developments, and there's also just like you know a huge influx of, of just other like private development. So um, again, I don't think that I, I, that this is necessarily addressing that problem. I don't know if a plan is to zone some of Hope Hill to Mary Lynn. Like, again, I just don't think that the, the district has done a great job communicating what some of their strategic vision is. And I think this is a group of pretty rational people that like, if you can explain that, um, it would be helpful. So Sorry for taking so much time. I appreciate it. And um, thanks for all the work you do. Yeah, thank you. No, those, those are great things to bring up. I couldn't agree more around, especially the um, planning for five and 10 years. Like really, and that we've done a terrible job with facilities master planning. We haven't done it. <laughs> we've waited until we're just, we have no options. And it's almost like just ripping off a band-aid. It's terrible. So agree with you. And, and even in that process, you know, they're going to be hard, uncomfortable conversations. But when you as a district are saying, okay, we're looking long range, we're looking at our numbers, and our focus is what's best for students. Like, how do we make sure all our students, you know, have the core resources they need academically, and then exposure and experiences, which really come from having strong numbers and sustainable schools. Like in my area, we have schools that have less than 350 kids. Like you're never gonna be able to provide all the resources you need in those schools because you just, it doesn't work out number wise, even though those kids get more money underneath the student success formula, which is extremely important. But even their experiences are a bit limited just in, you know, you're not, you're having to share maybe an art teacher or a theater teacher or what have you. So those are things that are on my mind all the time about long range planning. Um, and Hope Hill, I know that's not the focus of this conversation, but yes, I'm looking forward to it being worked out between the city and APS. Um, and in my dream world, having a much bigger school there with an awesome rec center and gym that better serves the community, um, and then, yeah, who knows, you know, looking at those numbers, which I know even more old fourth ward families will send their kids to Hope Hill. And in addition to that, the density right there, which that area has an incredible mix from quality affordable housing that's permanent, thank goodness, to, you know, denser condos and things of that nature and townhomes and everything else, which brings in a rich mix of families and students, and it brings in a lot of students. So maybe one day they might be shifted to Maryland. I don't know, but we need to have those conversations and talk about those projections and planning. And certainly around Midtown and then for Jackson, you know, yes, we need to get creative, but we need to be realistic about looking at our numbers throughout the entire system, which board members brought that up a lot during Monday's meeting. Um, we cannot just be focused on, well, North Atlanta actually, it's a different situation there, but really Jackson and Midtown are the ones that are just like busting at the seams. Um, so appreciate you lifting all of that up. I, I do agree with you about how we're communicating this out, that we need to do a better job of explaining, you know, why again, the K-5, go deeper in that versus the split. If you want to go back to the K-5, sorry, the four or five for a minute, I think that's, yeah, it was not well put out why that was the best option academically for kids. And I heard a lot of feedback from educators as to why they thought that was such a wonderful model 
for kids academically and experientially in four or five, and that just wasn't shared. So I hear you, I share that feedback. I'm continuing to share that feedback. So I'll pause there, but yeah, I agree with everything you lifted up. And um, I, I think it would be good. I'm just gonna throw this out. If we had a separate meeting with Emin Park families, um, to talk about this more. So I, I'll follow up with you. And on I, that. I think Eric Goldberg maybe is. Trying and to Eric and I talk a lot. So I, I, <laughs> I, I will touch base with Eric. That does not surprise me. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I just, I want you all to know, I do really work hard to reach out to folks. I can't individually knock on everybody's door, but I'm glad I'm getting to know more of you right now. Um, and do we have a chat yet, Keith? What? <laughs> Why we don't have a chat. Um, but I want to make sure. Oh, I, unfortunately, have I wasn't able to... Um... I wasn't able to uh, add it to the thing. I would have to literally stop the meeting and, and start it back to do that. So. It's all good. It's all good. Mm -hmm. um, Katie, I will give you all my, my phone number and my email so y'all can contact me. That's what we're going to do at the end of the meeting. But yeah, we'll keep moving. Katie, um, sorry to interrupt. My friend Michelle's had her hand raised from yes, the very beginning. Yes, I'm sorry, she Michelle. Like the first one. She just has an iPhone written there. Yeah, Michelle, you go. Sure. Thanks. I'm trying to toggle through all this. Oh, I get it. Um, thanks, Melissa. Uh, so my name is Michelle. I'm a Maryland parent. I have a second grader and a rising kindergartner, and I'm also uh, an active board member um, in Inman Park Cooperative Preschool for eight years awesome. and very, very involved in the neighborhood and uh, connected um, and uh, care passionately about our children's educational experiences. So um, I'll, I'll add on to those who have already commented on this, but as a person who cares deeply, um, one of the things I do want to express is the process here for community engagement and accessibility to that community engagement has to be given like a really deep and hard look. Um, at the end of the day, like I'm a mom who works 50 plus hours a week and like just want to support all of my other time into my kids' education. It is really hard to understand like where are the community meetings? When are they happening? Like, and with all of these decisions happening so quickly post this recommendation, it's really intimidating. And um, so I, I would just ask if, if we could find a way on um, elementary school websites or on the board, just to make it very clear when you all are having these chats so that we can plug in and make sure that um, we're connecting with you. Um, that would be like a huge win. <laughs> I could not agree more. And I want to throw this out. Um, I've had people mention to me, like doing like a YouTube that has our meetings that people can just click on. Like you don't have to go to Facebook. You don't have to like be in person, but like if you miss something or even like a YouTube as to why the district is, thinks that K-5 is the best, you know, academic and everything else experience for our children in this cluster. And you could just click on it. <laughs> and watch it at your yeah I, it would go so long honestly like since this recommendation was passed down me and a group of moms many of whom are on this call feel like we have spent seven or eight days just trying to understand how to connect how to engage and that that has been a, a less than satisfactory experience so I appreciate you taking that feedback and I think your suggestion um could could definitely work um but on the matter at hand one of the things that for me I'm a Lake Claire mom so I want to make sure that Mary Lynn is a thriving school community for years to come. And um, I also care deeply about Inman Park community members because many of them are, are people I've worked with and been in the dirt with to make our kids' experience great for, for many years. And um, so I just wanna make sure that the recommendation and the board is considering the long-term um, strategy for the cluster. And I, I'm not seeing that. And what I, what I fear is in three to five years, um, all our, many of our kids are gonna be rezoned again uh, or impacted again. And they haven't had stability their entire elementary school career. My daughter had half of her kindergarten year disrupted, spent her first grade year on Zoom and her second grade year um, thank goodness has been in person, but it's been anything far from typical. And I just see her entire educational experience it being disrupted every three to five years. And, and that's not what we moved to um, this, uh, this cluster for um, when we moved here 10 years ago. Um, the other thing I will ask for is in the recommendation, I am not seeing any kind of um, conversation or data surrounding 
academic impact. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm very concerned about children at Maryland and children going um, from Inman Park neighborhood going to Spark. They're gonna be going into communities that in many ways are starting over. So the PTA will be gutted. Go team meetings will be um, displaced. Our go team committee members will be displaced. Um, teachers are going to be um, repurposed. Um, that would be the, the best outcome, but that's not guaranteed. And that continuity of education and support throughout a system, I, I fear is going to get lost. And so my number one ask is that we keep our Mary Lynn kids that are there today in Mary Lynn. We are not at risk of be, becoming overutilized in the next five to 10 years based on the projections I see. We have a very strong community and our kids are doing very well. And so I would just ask that we look out for those children who um, frankly are, are not, um, our, our communities are not at risk of overcrowding Mary Lynn um, in the next five to seven years. Um, and I, I just really would ask that we consider uh, stability for those, ch for those children. I appreciate that. And I, I'm written it all down. And um, I think we need it. I, I do think we absolutely need a deeper dive into why they are recommending that move. I hear you. Um, and I, and all your feedback about accessibility and really reaching my thing is always families. Um, I go to a lot of different meetings throughout the district or the system and it becomes very clear there are some people who are always, and I'm not knocking this people, I'm glad they're showing up, but you know, we know there are more people to reach and we've got to get creative to really reach our families and make sure they know what's going on and we're getting that direct feedback from them. Um, and there, there are definitely a lot of ways to do it. And I think the YouTube channel, just to find out what's going on quickly is just one piece of that. So I hear you loud and clear and I, I know my colleagues agree as well. And I use this moment to plug that um, board member Jones and I are working on creating a community engagement strategy for the board. Um, the district has theirs and we're providing this feedback like on this process, this is under them. However, the board should have an engagement strategy lined up with our student outcomes focused governance. Where we're going even in pairs to meetings, we have like a set schedule. So we're getting out in the community and we're we're not all over the place. Um, and that, you know, because even though some of us are district and then some of us are at large, at the end of the day, we serve the entire system and every student. Our decisions impact them all. So we need to know what's going on throughout the city. So looking forward to that coming to fruition and stay tuned. But I and hear I, you on accessibility here, for sure. I'm exactly. here, Katie, sorry. I can't take the name. Hey, I didn't see you. <laughs> Yay! I'm glad. I was like, but I do okay making our plug. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I've been listening. I just couldn't change my name on the screen, and I was a little bit late because I had to take my daughter to Howard. So, um, but I, I've been here, you know, listening. So, thank just you. Wanted thank you. Yeah. yeah now, um, you and I can, and others can talk more about, you know, getting additional feedback from um, Maryland families in Inman Park. We can provide that feedback jointly to the district for sure. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, Jamie is um, in line. Anyone, let's see, I have. Jamie has had her hand up the longest. Yeah, and there's, yeah, cause Jamie, and then there's someone with the iPhone. Was that you, Michelle, still? Yeah, that was Michelle. Okay, cool. So make sure I'm not missing who that is. Jamie, go for it. You're a limb parent. So thank you. Yes. All for being here. I will be. I will be brief because I have a another another meeting and I and I don't want to repeat all the things that have been said, but I'll say I, I do echo all of the Lynn concerns that we've heard so far. Um, I am an Inman Park parent. Uh, we actually moved this year from uh, Candler Park to Inman Park and uh, frankly would never have moved if we thought we were leaving Mary Lynn. Um, and so I haven't been that involved in Inman Park Neighborhood Association. I'll say that just because we have just moved, but um, one thing I wanted to bring up that I haven't heard a lot of before um, is that uh, in Inman Park, the majority of the economic and racial diversity at this point, or in the Lynn District, the majority of racial and economic diversity comes from the Inman side park of Moreland, um, mostly because Candler Park and Lake Clare have lost almost all of the affordable housing that they have. Um, and so if uh, the projections show that if the Inman Park side of um, the Lynn district is removed, 
Lynn will lose a substantial number of racially and ethnically uh, and economically diverse families which as you know, many of our in-town schools are already not very diverse. And so this for me is a huge, uh, a huge issue. And I have not seen any data that shows why our families need to be displaced. Um, and I think that one thing you mentioned earlier is that you know, you're know you not an educational expert. That is, that is my uh, academic and research background. And I'll say that one thing we do know from the data is that displacement is bad for students. If, and while we can't always avoid that, there's no reason to do it without a huge and important um, research base showing that it's needed. And so far, there's been nothing from the district that shows that there's any benefit to our students for displacing them. And the new K-5 option displaces six times the number of students than the dual campus option. So I'm not gonna say too much about dual campus since you say it's not, it's off the table at this point. I'm, I'm disappointed to hear that, but if it's, if, it, if it's a waste of our time to talk about it now, I won't spend a lot of time. Um, but I'll also say that I'm a, a special education parent at Lynn. And uh, we recently, a couple of years ago, had a dedicated uh, full-time special education program removed from Lynn. And the majority of the students served still in special education, um, you know, have lost a lot of resources from that already. And so I'm concerned that by removing another large portion of our students and losing teachers at Lynn, that we will lose additional special education services. Um, you know, I have seen my, my uh, fourth grader has been at Lynn since kindergarten. We moved into the district specifically for the special education services. Instead of going to private school, we really wanted to do public and go to a school that was really well equipped to deal particularly with autism and other related disorders. Lynn at the time had a dedicated room, a sensory room, and we've lost all of that. And I'm afraid that by losing more people and more resources, we will lose um, you know, those services that are so important to our students. I, I love our school, but we're already um, not serving those special education students as well with the loss of those resources. Um, and, you know, losing more students is always means losing more resources, even if, even if we don't want to. Um, and so, uh, you know, those are just additional things that, uh, you know, I haven't heard about it before. I, I, echo everything I have heard, but I wanted to bring up those kind of new additional uh, arguments as well. Um, and then I'm sorry, but I do have to get off the call. I have a, I have a work call at 10.30, but I appreciate you right. taking the time and I'm happy to happy to chat, um, you know, offline or another way. I, I have emailed and I'm, I'll be happy to follow up with an email again. Please, please do. And y'all, my Let's Talk is just, I, just Let's Talk is a great system, continue to use it, but there's an issue with my administrator stuff at APS. So please just email me. Um, and I know Jamie had to get off, but um, I do, I'm glad she lifted up um, special education services. I mean, these are the questions we need to be asking at the di district staff to address because that goes around support. So if you say you can do this K-5 and provide everything students need, you need to explain exactly how you're gonna provide those supports for those students. Um, and going back to me not being an educational expert, my real point is like board members, our job is not to say, here's what we recommend and we want this to happen and you should move these kids and change these lines. No, I mean, obviously you all know that comes from the superintendent, but we ask the questions around, you know, house is best for students, this model, providing the resources necessary, looking at each community for the unique community it is, and you're making sure that this model is best. So, those are the things we push in on. So I'm glad y'all are asking all these questions of me directly um, and know that a lot of these have been on my mind already. Um, and then, you know, looking at, yes, moving students, you've got to make sure you have every support in place to support that move because it's not easy, but also looking long range. So, you know, one thing with the K-5, which they're showing is the room we'll have in the schools to grow. Um, so one would hope we would not be right back here in three to five years. Um, but those are again questions that they, that they need to address and they need to dig deep into because that's part of it. We do want stability. Yes, rezoning changes can happen, but we don't want to be making them all the time clearly. So- okay. Yeah. Jump in real quick because I do know a little bit of history around the, the regional unit, the regional autism unit. I mean, that was a capacity issue um, because, you know, it, Maryland at the moment is at 82%. Um, and um, 
I know that doesn't sound like it's full, but you know, when we renovated Maryland and added capacity, there was extra, right? Um, and so they moved some, one of the, they had, they had two regional autism units, one for the younger kids and one for the older kids. And um, once you hit a certain capacity, it starts to get pretty tight. Um, and, you know, facilities master planning is one of the things that I did in my former life, <laughs> you know, and so there's a best practice, you know, the sweet spot for a school is about, you know, somewhere between 65 and 85 percent, right? And so I think it's really important for us to get our heads around what that means, um, because once you start passing 85 percent, that's why the consultants say that's where the flag goes up. That's when you start to say, all right, we're going to have to monitor this because it starts to get really tight, right? And so to put it in perspective, right now, Spark is, you know, depending on which capacity calculation you use, there's somewhere between 90 and 95 percent utilization rate right now, but their entire kindergarten class is in an off-site location. So when you start to get to 90, 95 percent, it's really uncomfortably tight. You know, once you get to 100, you know, you're going to have trailers before you get to 100. So I, I think it's important for people to understand what those capacity and utilization numbers really mean, because there's a perception that you know, you're rattling around in a building if you're at 82% and you're not. So I just wanted to put that out there. I'm glad you did. That was very well explained. And it makes me think also about the opportunities we have to provide more services when we have the space and understanding that you need smaller class sizes for some of that work. Um, that, you know, it's not one size fits all for every child and every need. And when you have some room, there are tons of opportunities there. So I'm glad you explain that, Tamara, because you have more background in that area for sure and connection to Mary Lynn. Um, Pat, I know your ha hand has been up. Sure, and um, I'm actually Laura. I don't know why my husband's name always shows up. Okay, right. I'm sorry, I've been Grace Howard. <laughs> no, that's okay. You know, almost every meeting with my daughter's name. So. I, I didn't go in and change Thank it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I won't take a lot of time. Um, I am a Maryland parent, but I'm also in Inman Park, I live in the Inman Park neighborhood. And a lot of my points are going to be very similar to the others. But since you talked about wanting more engagement with the Inman Park family, I, I thought I'd go ahead and speak up. Um, just a couple quick points. And I think it was Michelle who spoke, but I, I'll be honest, one of my biggest points is around kind of the academics uh, the academic impact of the K through five, I guess, versus the dual, but across all the schools. Um, so like everyone else, my daughter's in first grade. She spent her first year in elementary school virtual. She is, even in this kind of strange in-person environment, she is thriving. And it is, as a parent, so gratifying to be able to see her actually get an experience where she is feeling part of the community and she is growing leaps and bounds. So because of that, I feel very strongly about her having stability. And I feel very strongly about the Mary Lynn community and their role in, in having that. Um, I, I realize we're very lucky and, and none of this is precluding that, that we are not all lucky that we have options of multiple good schools in our system. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not blind to that, but just knowing the sheer disruption that's happened for most of these kids that are gonna be, would be impacted again in this scenario. Um, understanding the academic impact for all of these, what I would call high performing schools. Again, K through five, new. I don't doubt that in three to five years, it will probably be a wonderful school, but it's gonna take time to get it there. Spark, literally gut it. I mean, 500 students coming out of that, teachers coming out, like that's gonna look like a very different school. And again, in time, I think it will go back there. And so in five years, it will be fine. Um, and Mary Lynn also will be impacted. Um, and that community and school will look different. And we are lucky because there are parents like ours who will stay very engaged, but my daughter only has a few more years at school. And that means her entire experience will be in something that is you know, less than stable, that is transitional. And, um, and I think is not gonna, I think deliver the best probably economic out outcome to all of the students, much less from an emotional and a social standpoint. And so that's why you know, I continue to feel very strongly about wanting to understand that impact. What are they going to do to, you know, with all, if, if it's K through five, how are they going to mitigate that? I mean, we're still in the place where they're asking our students to go to school for an extra hour every day to mitigate learning loss from, from COVID, but at the same time saying it's okay to displace 800 students um, and they'll, they'll be able to kind of deal with that. Um, and so like, that's a big question for mine of how, how to marry those two things together. 
Um, and so that's that's honestly probably you know my biggest concern in all of this is that the true have we really do we really understand the economic impact for all of the schools, not just the, the people who are being displaced, but the students who are still there, if the school has to kind of start from scratch in some way, shape or form. Um, I mean, my, my second one, again, it's probably already been covered. It's just the fact that we know the big issue out there is still high school capacity and this doesn't address high school capacity. And it's it just leaves this, like we all know it's hanging over us and we don't know what it means. And you know, making a decision to use this capacity for something that's not gonna address that, like we know, we're just, I feel like we're just going to be having conversations around this again and again and again. And as a parent who's, you know, we understand nothing's stable, nothing's stable in this world, but looking for a little bit more sense of stability that like we are making the right choice to have our, you know, with Atlanta Public Schools, we were doing the right things for all the kids. I mean, that, I mean, that's my other biggest question. And as kind of board members, I would, I, I would really just beg you guys to help us kind of get to the point where we can at least get clarity about what might happen there. So yeah, yeah, we're we're with you. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done in that long range planning. Um, but right now we are focused on the elementary situation, which we wish we'd had a plan for that in advance, but here we are. I, and I I I think what people are trying to also maybe say is about using and then potentially for something with the overcrowding. And I I I really feel like we're all at a place where we know this needs to be used for elementary. And and people are coming to me like, can we buy this building near here for a ninth grade academy for Jackson, because we have overcrowding at Jackson. I mean, they have like 11 different lunch periods. And, you know, we, we got to look and what we'll be looking at is throughout the system and all our high schools. And we talk about serving all kids well. Um, so it, there's going it, to, it's not just y'all, it's going to be us too. And looking at what's best for students and outcomes and supports and resources. I'm glad you go back to resources because again, this is not my expertise, but I know enough to know that you've got to have a solid model in place and fully support it. And if you're doing like piecemeal stuff, you know, that, that could get complicated and not be sustainable. So yes, we have got to explain and have a lot of intentionality around engagement and getting the feedback back and understanding all unique communities and schools and then talking about the long range planning. And with this particular recommendation, to your point about having less students in a school, everything the district is doing to support that model and make sure that every child has every resource necessary and taking advantage of the fact that you will have room. I mean, it's great that you all have been able to thrive with larger class sizes, but that is not optimal. Like kids can get lost in that mix too. Um, you want that area we have room to breathe and you know offer different um, supports for all your students because you know we know we have kids who have special needs throughout all our schools, and that is what we need to be doing with you know reducing the numbers in these schools. Is like what can we push in additionally to make sure we're supporting all students and looking also starting in August, our progress monitoring that really digs into the data to say like at Morningside, yeah, these kids are doing great, but could they be going here? And these kids are still here and how do we get them here? So that is what this should all be about too, is how we're best serving kids, having more room and pushing in the resources. I don't think just because you go down the numbers, you're gonna necessarily have less resources. Um, I think we can do all of this very well, but yes, we have to have the district explain what they're doing to fully support it and even go like, you know, beyond innovation. So Katie, yes, all your questions are very, very important. Katie, I think you've kind of answered one of my questions. I'm taking um, notes and I wanted to ask Laura um, to clarify. She said economic impact in it. I, I think that that's what you were speaking to. Is it economic or academic? Sorry, Sorry I meant academic, emotional, and social. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I got here. And so for people who were, you know, talking about, you know, trying to solve the high school capacity with this thing, I mean, several, a few years ago, you know, that was when, it, like, if you go way back to 2019, 2020, the presentation that was presented at the Inman cafeteria, you know, and then things after that had contemplated a, a five, six, you know, seven, eight, nine, like a five academy and then a seven, eight, nine, you know, and then high school, but that was taken off the table a few years ago, you know, and I know that there were some people who were really upset 
impact, you know, you know, but, you know, that is something that the district did explore and, you know, decided that they didn't have, you know, the ability to pull that off. Um, and it, that, so I just wanted people to know that it's not like it wasn't looked at. Um, it had complications, um, you know, in that the ninth graders, you know, a ninth grade academy is different than putting a ninth grade into a middle school because the ninth graders are still the responsibility for reporting purposes at the state level of the high school principal. And so it just got really thorny. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Tamara. And I did go to that meeting before I yeah. even decided to run for office. It was an yeah. awesomely attended meeting. I, yeah. 450 people, that was amazing. Yeah, if um, process, that was a good one, <laughs> you know, so. We need to get back there and we're gonna get back there in different creative ways. I'm excited about exploring all of them. And I, I apologize again, that was like this meeting. I can stay on, but I know people need to get on with their Friday. Uh, Keith, you said Lori and Dion and I see Elizabeth. Um, Lori, are you out there? Still, no? All right. Yeah, she just spoke. So it's Dion oh, I'm so now. sorry, that was, okay, got it. My, my bad, I apologize, Dion, and then Elizabeth, and then we'll start to wrap up, but yeah, I can talk with anyone additionally if need be. Hi, thanks for having these meetings, Katie. Um, I missed the beginning of the meeting, and so if I ask something or mention something, I apologize if I'm repeating. Um, first question is, and ho hopefully I can ask, there's four. Um, is I see you're recording this meeting. I know there's a lot of people who are not able to be on this meeting today, teachers, staff, and parents who would benefit from some of the answers even I saw um, just in this last part I've been on. Could you make this available um, on your own YouTube Katie channel, this recording so that parents can hear this? I think it would really help with some of the questions and concerns we have. That's a great suggestion. I'll look into how I could do a YouTube, but if not, I'll just send out the link. So that would be great. I will, I will and then we will, we will, we will, as many people, you know, we will get it out to as many communities as we can across the cluster. So I uh, appreciate that and district, whoever wants it. Mm -hmm. um, another clarifying question. I guess I'm a little bit confused because I've definitely tried to be engaged the last 10 years. And at the board meeting, um, and I don't mean to take a step back, I want us to continue to move forward. At the board meeting, I thought I heard Herring say that the first recommendation could be different from the second recommend, second reading recommendation, mm -hmm. which was very confusing for me. And she also had the attorney, Gupta, clarify that. And what you just said was different. But, well, but also of, what I heard at the board meeting was very, I mean, there was a lot of things that, a lot of confusion. So are you saying that 100% the first recommendation and second recommendation have to be the same? Okay, so first, I'm not an attorney. I'm sorry, first read, first read. So, yeah, first, read. first, I'm not an attorney. Because there was a lot of back that. and forth. Remember, so there was think, a lot of back and forth. I think the way I interpret that is there could be, I assume, some changes made to this recommendation, but to change drastically once you've had a first read on one to a completely different thing in the second, I don't think that would fall within okay. our policy. But that's okay. why I continue to tell people, provide feedback, go to the meeting, right. uh, same whatever thing. way. Yeah. These are the things that they yes. need to dig into and they can, the superintendent can make adjustments. But the board members right. shouldn't be saying at a meeting, okay, let's move this around and this, like y'all get how the process right. works. So yeah, right. I don't, yeah, I, for, think, her to change I think it, everyone um, needs this, to give their feedback. Campus, yeah, we would have to, I would think, deal with this recommendation now, let's say hypothetically. Um, right something doesn't go through on it, then you'd have to start anew with something else, which, which could be another recommendation. But I would think we need to finish out this recommendation within this time frame because we started the process. Because to me, okay. to do something different, I think that would be against policy and it wouldn't be transparent. I think that okay. would be very confusing. And that was the confusing part because how I interpreted that and many others was that the recommendation could be different, even in terms of model. Uh, I think so it could I be tweaked you. based on the K-5, but I think going to a completely different 
set up scenario like the split campus, that's very, that's just different. Um, and that was not the recommendation, but yeah, I mean, in terms of like okay. tweaking it somewhat, maybe that is possible. And that's what I'm gonna be finding out too. But that's why, again, continue to provide the feedback, but it would be on the yes. K-5 recommendation. Um, and with that said, um, at the Board of Education meeting, Travis um, suggested, I'm sorry, he mentioned some tentative dates for next week. Mm -hmm. And we've been sharing those dates, um, but we haven't heard confirmation and it's Friday at 1045 and some of those dates and times were days away. Could um, Tamara and you advocate to push those out as early as possible today so we can get those on the calendar? Yes, I've already brought that up a couple times Thank and you. we will make sure I will send out an email and, you know, hopefully you'll be hearing from their team soon, like in terms of a robocall, email, text. But yeah, we'll push Perfect. on that as well. We're with you. Okay. And then um, Tamara, you um, made a great point um, about, and one other parent about pre-Ks and Tamara made about capacity. When we're talking about the potential of the K-5 and the recommendation that Herring made, um, we're all wanting pre-Ks at our school, the option to add them. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like from the federal level, you know, over the next probably less than 10 years, um, that's probably, we're going to see that. Tamara mentioned that sweet spot of 60, I forget the exact, but 60 to 80%. With this new K-5, you have two schools, I believe on day one, if the numbers stay as predicted, will be at 82 and 83%. So already in that hot spot as in concern. <laughs> to move lines. So I think that that question needs to be raised and that doesn't consider, um, I know Hope Hill has a pre-K, but that doesn't add in a Morningside pre-K. So um, can you just put that on the note? And I know you're not with Morningside, but just a, a capacity thing mm -hmm. that some of the other parents mentioned and adding pre-Ks, because I know that's district-wide, we would love to you know, offer that. And I believe from a federal level, that's coming down more. Yeah. Um, and I think see. just having the opportunity to have more in your cluster is great to start there. So, so yeah. I, I do agree that with many parents, if this K-5 goes forward, I think we need to look at those lines, especially in Morningside more, because I have a concern as a Morningside parent that we're already at 83% day one without a pre-K. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Um, um, okay, more information. Oh, Several of us have put in open records requests because we haven't seen um, many of the reports that were referenced. And I know some of the other Mary Lynn parents mentioned these um, questions about academic data, socioeconomic data, equity impact, et cetera. Specifically, they mentioned a socioeconomic graphic report versus a census report, an equity impact assessment for all of the Sizemore's proposals and the APS K-5 recommended current proposal and the demographic reports for race, students with disabilities, socioeconomic status, and one for transportation funding in the different scenarios. I think it would be beneficial for everyone. Um, and this goes for any lines drawn, your Thomasville Heights too, your Slater, any feedback. Um, just having those reports accessible so we are not going back and forth with Erica Long about trying to get access to these reports and playing the lawyer game. It's getting exhausting. Okay, yeah, I hear Sorry. you. And uh, they did a run through. <laughs> um, because of... they, they, I mean, like, I can give you the time remarks where they mentioned very detailed reports about all Sizemore proposals and the APS K5 recommended current proposal. I think, you know, we're all just asking questions. If those proposals, if those, uh, um, I'm sorry, assessments were done. I keep hearing questions that parents want this information. That could help with just a lot of questions, being more transparent and upfront with the data. No, I hear you. And all that information they shared, yeah, I, I was paying close attention and I think that should be available for sure. And I can ask about that. Okay, because we have put in um, reports and now we're trying to roll in the ombudsman's office. Deirdre Smith, I know parents have reached out to. We're trying to use the process that the Board of Education has set up to help us get information and advocate for itself. But like, um, and I greatly appreciate you and Tamara starting these communities set up with direct board information because it's it's really frustrating. 
I hear if you. you even have the t even if you have the time and and like one parent said at, at the meeting I stand here and I don't represent Dion Malik from Morningside um, I'm trying to advocate for the entire district on that point nutrition and hydration thank you thank you guys the Board of Education for having these discussions um, The cluster information is frustrating for Midtown, but the nutrition and hydration needs to be talked about. Mm -hmm. When my fifth grade son comes home and tells me, thanks mom for packing extra lunch because our entire class didn't have lunch today. Um, and we all shared our lunch boxes. When a morning side kid who has options is telling you that, I wonder what's going on for other kids that those are their only meals for the day. Tamara, thank you for asking about the supper program. I didn't even know about it. Um, it's not um, an option for our school, but as a parent who has now a Howard parent and who works the tardy desk, <laughs> I see a hundred kids come in every day who go to the convenience store and they're late because they're going to the convenience store, walking to McDonald's. Water bottles in hand, they don't even have a book bag. Um, if they have money to go to the convenience store. So filling waters, it's not happening. Um, cups, I can tell you, and I'm not gonna call out the schools, cups aren't happening. Um, so we need to address some of these things. Um, supper program, I did do a let's talk and um, looked up the information about how many schools qualify for, for supper program for next year, 57, all but Mary Lynn in your cluster qualify for supper program next year. Mm -hmm. So I think getting out that information is important. Um, I know personally, I'm going to share that let's talk with as many people as I can, but any parents that are listening, please share that information. Thomasville Heights, Slater, your entire cluster. I just looked at your Board of Education website and what schools rep you represent, everyone except Mary Lynn. With that said, um, Hope Hill is on the list to receive the supper program. But those kids, when they go to Howard, cannot get the supper program. So I know some of those kids are dropped off early or walk, and then they're there to football practice or in the community and need access. So I think that's, that's something that I know all of our schools have, kiddos who could benefit from supper program, but the percentages aren't there. We all have low-income students, homeless students. I believe Spark had mentioned that they have the highest population of homeless. I don't know if that's true or not true, um, but I think we should figure out how we can address that gap because um, we need to. Our kids should not be hungry and at school. They're not going to be successful. We can't even talk about what education models we're doing if our kids are hungry and thirsty, to be honest with you. They're not functioning. No, we agree 100%. That's so why we ask so, so many so questions thank you, in that and presentation. I'm not, yeah, we got a lot of work to do on nutrition. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think yeah. I think that's it. But I just did want to say, board of education engagement pairs consider the option. Um, and oh, in regard in regards to um, the K five, mm -hmm. the feedback I've heard is parent want options. I heard Travis say we gave you guys options to discuss. I would ask for that same thing to be offered to, and I know this is a sensitive topic, but your topic, the Thomasville Heights parents, I'm now hearing that some of them might want other options in Slater. Um, so I'm advocating for them to have same options as there were discussions on the table for the Midtown cluster. And, and just to touch on that briefly, uh, Mike, having that deadline extended, I've been talking to the superintendent about that. I've been talking directly with some families um, of Thomasville Heights students, in particular the 62 students that will, you know, still be in the neighborhood and would be rezoned re to Slater. Um, and then the situation for Forest Cove families is very different and unique and fluid. And, you know, certainly any that stay in the, the city limits should be able to, you know, obviously go to their zone school, but maybe some um exception can be made there too considering all the trauma they've been through so i appreciate you lifting them up i am very focused on them for sure um could not agree more with you on the nutrition 
Tamara is in, right there with me and my kids are at King Middle School. And yes, they have a supper program provided through after um, school through All Stars. Um, there are many programs like that. There's been one at Jackson, but yeah, the APS nutrition has to get real about reaching all kids with after school snacks and dinner um, and making sure we're connecting with um, school administration and not just maybe tapping an individual and saying this is offered and they don't respond and then never it's never done. And then the quality of food, I for one would love it to be in-house. So we'll see what happens there. Stay tuned, keep advocating. So, yes. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Dion. And I know- let's Oh, see, the Elizabeth, video, it, you said you would send out, push out the video? Yeah, yeah, Keith and I will work on that. So we'll, we'll take this so recording much. and send out a leak. And then Elizabeth, and then I'm gonna start to wrap us up. Hey babe. Hello. Hi. Um, so one thanks to Dion because she is like forever posting very neutral data and information. So appreciate that. Just want to say that. Um, and then the other question I have is about administrative transfers. Um, so if you know that like the optimal, like the max is like 85%, why is the threshold at 90% for administrative transfers? If the K-5 does go through, then, you know, just, you know me, like I am in support of increasing diversity, increasing socioeconomic diversity across Spark and at whatever the Inman K through five would be called. Um, but I guess the question is about like, it sounded like at that last board meeting that Herring was talking about like, you know, maximizing administrative transfers, um, you know, up to the 90% threshold. So that's just kind of a question. If you know that that's not academically good for children to get above 85%, why is the threshold 90? And then the other question I have is just about like the resources. So one of the teachers at Spark was talking about with administrative transfers that they can only go, they can only increase uh, the student body to the extent that they have teacher teachers present, right? So if the plan is to maximize administrative transfers to get to whatever 85, 90% at Spark, at the new Inman K through five, then is APS planning to, you know, hire basically teachers across grade levels to ensure that those kids that want transfers have, you know, the resources and that class sizes are small enough. So it's kind of two sides of the same question. I do. Great questions. I, can, I want Tamara to take that administrative yeah. transfer one first. Yeah, I can offer, and, and so I apologize if I have, um, you know, caused a, a, an incorrect perception. So eighty-five percent is still comfortable, but over that is where it starts to get, you know, you start to go, hmm, you know, maybe I'll, you know, change the way I use the building. Maybe I'll, you know, um, it, you know, you just start to have different conversations. Ninety percent is where you cut off administrative transfers, right? Yeah. Because you just can't handle anything. So I think that there's nothing, you know, that's not in conflict. Um, when I was saying the sweet spot, it's like, you know, you're comfortable planning. You know, this is just a, from a facilities planning perspective, right? So academic delivery does not fall off after 85%. We know that, right? Because, you know, both Spark and Morningside are amazing, very successful schools. You know, they've got really creative, Spark has a K-Annex, you know, you know, Morningside has been really creative when they were, you know, busting out the seams that they're building. They did have trailers, you know, um, it just gets more difficult, you know, when you're that full. Yeah. Um, and I did not get the sense that it was the superintendent who was saying that. I think there was a board member who raised, you know, you know um, out, is there the possibility of this, you know, and you know, so I think it was just tossed out there. I don't think that there has been, you know, substantial conversation, you know, the administration was probably going to look at it, but we've not heard, you know, at least I haven't, you know, about there being an overarching plan to maximize the, the building. But I think that's, I, I'm not aware of anything like that being discussed. Okay. Yeah. I just said that question about resources. Would, would APS add funding for additional teachers? Or is that something that the principal has to plan for? I don't know. I don't understand that administrative trans 
Like, does yeah. that, there all those applications go in and then resources are, are decided upon? I mean, and there's a process there clearly, but also it's up to the discretion of the principal. Okay. Too. And I, I would, you know, strong principals are obviously going to say, okay, can I support yeah. these many kids coming depending upon their need and what's going on? So at least, you know, there is flexibility there. Um, it's good we have an administrative transfer process for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the focus right now will obviously be, you know, making sure we have everything our kids zone for these schools need right okay. now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, funding, would there be room? Sure. And then that would have to be case by case basis. Yeah, so. the, funding is, the funding is tied to enrollment, right? So for, you know, you get a per pupil allotment, you know, based on what the yeah. enrollment um, mm -hmm. so, you know, just by that alone, you know, whatever your enrollment is, the school is going to get that extra amount and they can decide, you and know, the administrative transfer application is like earlier, I guess. I don't know the timing around that, but that would, yeah. that would impact yeah. enrollment. It's around four. Right? They, they okay. just closed, they closed administrative transfer for next year in April or March, something like March. that. I think it's I think late March. March. So it gives, it gives. Yeah, late March. Time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But those are good questions. And um, yep. yeah, well, I know I, I apologize again for the confusion on the start time. I'm, we're gonna nail this down. I just added the virtual, but I'm glad I have because it's I want to reach people um, when most convenient for them. So we will lock in what the next Friday meeting, which, oh my goodness, that will be in June. I cannot believe it um, will be, but I will continue to have Friday morning virtual coffees. I'll probably move it up to nine, but I'll make sure that's clear. There's this, isn't this confusion. So thank you for bearing with me today, um, being that it was 9.30 on another flyer. Um, I really appreciate all this, all your questions, all your concerns, all your advocacy, all your commitment to your schools um, and all of APS. Uh, no, I'm, you can reach me, you can reach Tamara anytime. I'm going to just read out my email right now for anyone who needs it. It's katie, K-A-T-I-E dot Howard at Atlanta dot K-12 dot G-A dot U-S. Tamara, you're the same, right? Tamara dot Jones, T-A-M-A-R-A -A dot Jones. And then here's my cell. I do have it on my business card, so you may reach out to me on it. 404-210-6170. Um, and please email me just real quickly on my APS email. I'll make sure I have your email address because following this meeting, what I do is I do a recap and I'll do it after my coffee tomorrow that I have at Community Grounds in the Carver Cluster. Um, but I'll do a recap. Um, Dion, I'll try to include the link to this meeting. Um, also, make sure everyone has the updated um, recommendation and information from Monday. And I will, we will push to get those meeting dates for engagement around this phase um, that should be coming up like next week. Um, out as soon as possible. So I will just wrap up things in my email and send it out to you all. So thank you all again. If you have any questions in the interim, please reach out to me and Keith is available as well. So y'all, thank you again. And I hope everyone has a good Friday and weekend. Thank you. Thank you you thank be you blessed all. too. Appreciate y'all. Thank you, Mr. Thank Darcy. You. <laughs>